Is your Wi-Fi underperforming, slow speeds, dropping in and out? There's nothing worse than being in the middle of a conference call, gaming online, or streaming a video when things buffer or drop right out completely. It's both inconvenient and frustrating. In today's video, I'm gonna help you overcome these issues. G'day, welcome to Mad About Tutorials, my name's Matt. I've been working with networking, both wireless and ethernet for over 15 years now, and I get asked a lot of times, how do I fix my Wi-Fi? I want better speed, I want better coverage, I want better performance. Now, unfortunately, there's not a one solution fits all for this problem, but there is a range of different things you can try and or buy to overcome these problems. In today's video, we're gonna be discussing the different types of Wi-Fi available and the technologies they bring, which Wi-Fi will give you the best speed, range, and performance. I'm gonna help you assess your Wi-Fi needs. We're gonna look at ways to prevent congestion on your Wi-Fi and ways to extend or expand your Wi-Fi network to prevent black spots or packet loss, giving you the information you need to make a decision on what solution fits your needs best. Let's get started. First up, let's break down some terminologies to make things a little bit easier to understand later on this video. Wi-Fi bands, these are the signal at which your Wi-Fi operate. This is talked about in gigahertz, so 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz. I will say there's no relation between 5 gigahertz and 5G mobile networks. So conspiracy theorists, you can put down your hazmat suits. Your Wi-Fi isn't gonna activate your COVID vaccine. Wi-Fi generations. Uh, these are talked about in like Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 7. There's no direct relation to these numbers and the bands that we just talked about. This is just the iteration that Wi-Fi has released. It's like iPhone 14, iPhone 15. The only difference with Wi-Fi, of course, is they add technology, not take it away. Wi-Fi channels. These are the frequencies at which each Wi-Fi band can communicate. These are talked about in megahertz, so 20 megahertz, 40 megahertz, 80 megahertz, 160 megahertz. This is something that's heavily overlooked by people when they're troubleshooting their Wi-Fi network. Bandwidth. This is one a lot of people get confused with. When we're talking about network traffic, we talk about bits. When we talk about file size on your computer, we talk about bytes. There's eight bits to a byte. So if I was talking about 100 megabit per second, that's 12.5 megabytes per second. If I was talking about 100 megabytes per second, that's 800 megabits per second. And obviously 1,000 megabytes in a gigabyte, 1,000 megabits in a gigabit. Make sense? Next is packets. When files are sent over a network, they're broken down into tiny little pieces and then they're reassembled on the other end to make up the file or the media that you're watching or listening to. Which technologies are available on different generations of Wi-Fi? Starting with Wi-Fi 4, Wi-Fi 5, and Wi-Fi 6, these are all dual band 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi standards. They were developed over 10 years between 2009 and 2019, during which they advanced from 600 megabit per second to 1300 megabit per second. While Wi-Fi 5 is still a very usable standard in homes today, Wi-Fi 6 is gonna be crucial for those who have many Wi-Fi connected devices. It's the solution for people who are using laptops, computers, gaming consoles all at the same time while streaming 4K video and using smart devices like Wi-Fi surveillance cameras. Wi-Fi 6E was released in 2020. It uses 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, and now 6 gigahertz bands. The additional spectrum giving users better bandwidth and less interference. Wi-Fi 7, released last year in 2024, was a major improvement on Wi-Fi 6E, now boasting speeds of up to 46 gigabit per second, with one major improvement. It allowed enabled devices to be able to utilize 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, and 6 gigahertz bands simultaneously, meshing them together, giving users the best range, speed, and penetration. If you're living in a densely populated area like a city, Wi-Fi 6 or Wi-Fi 7 are gonna be the best solution for avoiding congestion. So whether you're streaming 4K video gaming or video conferencing, the experience is gonna be faster and smoother than ever before. Which Wi-Fi band will give me the best speed, range, and overall performance? Unfortunately, with Wi-Fi, it's give and take. The lower the gigahertz, the better the range and obstacle penetration. The higher the gigahertz, the faster the speed. To break it down to each range, 2.4 gigahertz. 
It's the slowest, offering a maximum speed of 600 megabit per second. It does have the best obstacle penetration with a maximum theoretical range of 800 feet or 240 meters. It only has 11 available channels, which will lead to network congestion and overcrowding. 2.4 gigahertz is also prone to interference from devices like microwaves and garage door openers. So best not to have your router in the garage or in the kitchen. As we move forward in time, we see less and less 2.4 gigahertz compatible devices being manufactured. 5 gigahertz offers mid-range coverage with speeds sufficient for most modern homes today. With speeds of up to 1.3 gigabit per second and a maximum theoretical range of 200 feet or 60 meters, it offers 23 available channels which will reduce interference. Excellent choice for high speed activities such as gaming or streaming within close range to your Wi-Fi access point or router. It's also supported by most modern Wi-Fi devices. 6 GHz offers the best speed of 9.6 gigabit per second. It's got 59 available channels, allowing for blazing fast speeds for up to 200 devices in concurrent use. The downside is poor penetration with a limited maximum theoretical range of 50 feet or 15 meters. An important point to note with Wi-Fi is the further you are from your router and the more obstacles in the way, the more your connection speed and quality will degrade. Tests have shown using 6 GHz Wi-Fi being at the maximum distance of 50 feet or 15 meters, users experienced a disgraceful 420 megabit per second. That's a mere 5% of the 9.6 gigabit expected. Assessing your Wi-Fi needs. To assess which Wi-Fi setup is going to be right for you, first, you need to consider all of the devices you have connected, what you do with them, when, and what sort of range you're covering. Firstly, make a list of all of the Wi-Fi devices you have connected, from desktop computers to laptops, gaming consoles, VR headsets, tablets, phones, smart TVs, surveillance cameras, network attached storage. Once you've got a list, then you can start to consider what sort of data you're going to be using on them. For example, surveillance cameras are used 24-7, whereas a gaming console is only going to be used during peak times in the afternoons and evenings. Also, how much are you relying on cloud storage between iCloud, OneDrive, Google Drive, and also how much you're relying on cloud-based applications? How much are you collaborating through the internet or are you storing everything locally on a network drive? Once you've worked all that out, then we can do a bit of a sum to calculate what your data usage will be during peak times. Here's a quick guide to help you work out what your data throughput would be. Streaming music, less than one megabit per second. Scrolling through social media on a phone, less than one megabit per second. Gaming, one to five megabit per second. Streaming movies at 720p, three to five megabit per second. 1080p, five to 10 megabit per second. 1440p, 10 to 20 megabit per second. And 4K is 20 to 50 megabit per second. Point to note, if you're streaming through Twitch or YouTube, you're on the lower end of that scale. If you're streaming through Netflix or KO, you're going to be on the higher end of that scale. Also, surveillance cameras, you can half that as a rule based off their frame rate and bit rate. VR headsets such as an Oculus Quest 3 can consume 50 to 100 megabit per second depending on the application you're using. Transferring files PC to PC, both using an SSD, 4 gigabit to 5 gigabit per second, or mechanical hard drive, less than 1 gigabit. Then consider how far apart all these devices are and where they're located in relation to your Wi-Fi router. Now, I know what you're thinking. My data throughput during peak times on my internal network is four to five gigabit per second and out to the internet is less than 500 megabit per second. So tell me why would I need a 46 gigabit router? To that, I say marketing. Ways to prevent congestion on your Wi-Fi. Use a channel analyzer. This way you can ensure that your Wi-Fi router is not using the exact same channels as neighboring Wi-Fi devices and also that you're not using overlapping channels. Now some Wi-Fi routers are intelligent and will scan and make changes to this as required. Others aren't. In that case, you can download channel analyzers onto your phone or your computer. You can scan your Wi-Fi network, see what channels other devices are on and ensure that you're not using the same ones. Some apps will even make recommendations as to which channels you should be on. Utilize all of the bands available on your Wi-Fi router and prioritize devices on them. For some silly reason, we just automatically connect every device to the fastest available network when it doesn't need to be. Say your mobile phone, for example, is only using five megabit per second on a regular basis. So it makes sense to put it on the 2.4. It's gonna get better coverage on it anyway. 
I recommend putting laptops, mobile phones, tablets, smartwatches, smart speakers, doorbells, RoboVax and surveillance cameras all on the 2.4 network, prioritizing things like your gaming desktop, smart TV and network attached storage to your five or six gigahertz network if you've got it. Set up guest networks. Not only can you set bandwidth limits on guest networks to prevent devices from draining your network for no reason at all, but it's also great for security for cloud accessible and vulnerable devices like doorbells and RoboVax. That way, if someone happens to find a vulnerability, they're safely segregated from the rest of your network, preventing them from attacking it. Ways to extend or expand your Wi-Fi to prevent black spots and packet loss. Black spots are where you've exceeded the maximum range of the Wi-Fi band you're trying to connect to, or there's too many obstacles between you and the access point. Now, this is more common on a five gigahertz or six gigahertz bands. Packet loss is caused by congestion or interference on your network. Black spots can be a major contributor to packet loss. Now, we can never completely eliminate packet loss. This is normal on any network. While we can't control what happens out on the internet, we can reduce it on our own network. Let me explain what packet loss is. When we send files over the network, they're broken up into hundreds, thousands, millions, or even billions of little pieces. These pieces are all labeled so they can be reassembled on the other end. These are called packets. With some protocols, like when we're downloading a file, we use TCP. This protocol requires every packet to arrive so it can be reassembled in the correct order. If a packet's not received, our computer will send a message back and say, hey, I didn't receive this packet, can you resend it? This consumes a small amount of data as does resending that packet. A small amount of packet loss will go unnoticed, but if it starts to get out of control, it causes a snowball effect because all of those requests being sent back starts consuming more data than it should and creates a bigger problem. Other protocols that we use are UDP, and this is more common in video conferencing, voice communication, or online gaming. Now we can identify this, and I'm sure we've all seen it before, say in a voice call where the other person starts to sound gibberish and starts to sound like a robot, or in online gaming where you experience rubber banding. Not having adequate coverage for the amount of users, bandwidth, or area you're trying to saturate will lead to black spots and of course in turn lead to excessive packet loss. But picking up your wireless router and just moving it to a central location may not be possible, as with avoiding obstacles like thicker doors, glass, walls, and furniture. There's a couple of solutions available and let's have a look at them. The first is range extenders. These are affordable, they're easy to install, small form factor, and they plug into a wall socket a lot like a nightlight. The downside to them is that they are their own network. That means they have their own SSID and their own password. So switching between your main network and your range extender won't be seamless. It's not a great solution for mobile phones. The other downside to them is bandwidth sharing. Your main router will see this as any other device and will only give it the allocated amount of bandwidth. So let's just say you have nine other devices connected to your wireless router with your Wi-Fi extender. That Wi-Fi extender is only gonna get 10% of the bandwidth allocation. It means all of the devices on that Wi-Fi extender are now fighting for that 10%. However, if you only have a few users, and you don't have any devices connected to your main wireless router, you're able to put your Wi-Fi extender in a central location, this is a great solution. This is gonna get you out of trouble. Also, if you're just trying to extend Wi-Fi to a further part of your house to connect random devices, maybe a smart switch, a Wi-Fi camera, this is another great solution. It's gonna get you out of trouble in a pinch. However, the other and far better option is to set up a mesh Wi-Fi network. Now this will set you back a little more, but will enhance your Wi-Fi network immensely. A mesh Wi-Fi network is where you have multiple access points that all communicate with one another as one network, which means you only have one SSID and one password per Wi-Fi band, the same you would with a standalone router. One access point will act as the master, the others will act as sl Wait, can we, can we still use those terms these days? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, no, I didn't think so. Um, so one access point will act as the primary, which is where you'll set all of your config your SSID, your password, your port forwarding, your guest network, and anything else. And then it automatically passes that information across to all the secondary access points, making it really easy to set these things up. Meshed Wi-Fi access points can send data backwards and forwards between each other at high speeds without the need of running network cables across your home or office. They're intelligent enough to load balance you to many access points or load balance you away from a congested access point. The key to setting up a successful mesh network is to carefully plan where you're gonna put each access point. 
Putting them too far away is gonna limit their speed and not having enough in high demand areas is gonna cause congestion. They're available in Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, and Wi-Fi 7, which should put something in just about everyone's budget. They're also available in ceiling mount or bench top mount. So in conclusion, Wi-Fi 6 is still more than enough for most applications. When you consider that majority of our data throughput is out to the internet, unless you're lucky enough to have 10 gigabit internet or faster, your bottleneck isn't gonna be the Wi-Fi router, it's going to be your internet connection. But if you are in the market for a Wi-Fi upgrade, at this point in time, I would strongly consider Wi-Fi 6 or 6E, either a router for small homes and offices or a two to three pack mesh setup for medium to large homes. Wi-Fi 7 is still a little bit on the pricey side right now. In Australia, a Wi-Fi router will set you back around $700 e-dues, and for a three pack mesh setup, you're looking about $1,200 to $3,000. I'd also avoid anything labelled gaming with a porcupine array of antennas. These things are cleverly marketed at gamers' egos, so unless you're hosting Wi-Fi LAN parties in a 50 square metre apartment, you're just wasting your money. So there you have it. A strong understanding of the Wi-Fi technologies available will help you make an educated decision on what setup is going to be right for you. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share this video if you found it helpful. See you in the next video. Bye.